Welcome to another episode of Ecom at One, and today's guest is Lewis Ellis, um, the director of Hive Digital Media and star of The Apprentice, and also Hidden Travel. How are you doing, Lewis? You okay? Good. How are you? <laughs> I'm all right, thank you. I'm very well, very well. I love the microphone. <laughs> I know. I just realised in shot, isn't it? And I was like, damn it, but it's there now, so it can just stay there. All good, all good. So maybe I thought we'd just kick off with a little introduction from yourself, please, Lewis, if that's all right. Yeah, so uh, my name's Lewis from Manchester. I was on The Apprentice this year, I just uh, on 2019's uh, Apprentice, which actually will be the only one for the next year, I believe, because it's been cancelled. Um, and I am working in marketing. I'm a digital marketing director at an agency in Manchester. Um, I'm also co-founder of a travel brand called Hidden Travel. Um, yeah, so busy, busy boy. Yeah, lots of, lots of things going on. So... I guess every interview you do, obviously the, the apprentice gets brought up. Um, so I think we'll, we'll, we'll fire into that straight away and then we'll focus on some other bits as well. So what was your motivation behind going on The Apprentice? Um, do you know what? Here, here's a weird story for you. So I've, I watched the film Yes Man a few years ago. And ever since that point, I made a promise to myself. I made a covenant <laughs> to say yes to every opportunity. And I'm not even taking the mic. And I did that for quite a, a few years. And come around to 2018, it popped up in my feed. And I thought, you know what? It's another opportunity. I'm not going to say no. I just applied. I thought, you know, I've watched the show before. I'm, I'm probably at a point where I could probably get on it. Filled it out. Was really honest and open and forgot all about it. Yeah, oh, really? So how long went by from filling it in to sort of being on it then, was it? So I think I filled it in around my birthdays. Uh, so I'd, I'd have been just turning 28 at August time. And then I didn't hear anything back until I think it was like January. I was coming out of the gym and I just got an email. And I was like, oh, I haven't even got a suit. <laughs> um, and then well then i thought well should i even bother going because i've you know there'll be thousands of people and i know that loads and loads apply um but i took the risk and i just i went and bought a suit and obviously i didn't need to wear one because i work in digital um so i bought a suit i went down there on a saturday spent the entire day there took about i think nine uh, nine hours in total for the first interview round oh wow blimey blimey you know, I didn't, the, what I started feeling like I was getting somewhere when people started saying to me, I was getting through round after round, and people started saying to me, You look like you belong in the apprentice, you look like an apprentice person. I was like, That's such an insult. Um, <laughs> but I started to get a vibe that I was getting somewhere through it. Yeah, that was the first one. So that, yeah, so you watch the film, Yes Man, and literally it's just like, No fear, everything, just yes, 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 pretty much. Well, I, I've tried to trace where it came from and I've got it on my YouTube from years ago where I've sat in front of a camera and I'm really sad and I've literally just been speaking to myself. It's like a video diary and I'm saying, I'm sick of not getting where I want to be in life. From this moment forward, I'm going to take every opportunity. And it sounds like a stupid thing to do, but actually I didn't like how my life was. I, wanted, I knew I wanted more and I knew I wanted to achieve more. And since that point, I've taken every single opportunity that came along. Obviously not everyone, but I've waited up and I've gone, if it sounds like something I don't want to do, but it still has a potential positive, I do it anyway. So that's a great bit of advice for the guys that are listening into the podcast. Um, you know, just sort of plough through. Don't worry. Get on with it. <laughs> the weirdest things. That the, well, the weirdest things have happened. Things that you wouldn't even imagine. Like because just because you say yes to things, yeah. it sounds stupid. I'm not saying yes to every opportunity. Don't get me wrong. But yeah, if there's a potential for me, for example, um, you know, I once got asked if I wanted to go to a trampoline park in Manchester mm -hmm. before it opened um, with some of my friends. So I agreed to do that because I was like, why not? And then I managed to get a, a company that does Nerf guns to give me Nerf guns to go to Trampoline Park and they, their staff came with me. And then I had a group of people, so I decided to do Hunger Games. So I ended up filming this Hunger Games sort of battle on a trampoline park at eight in the morning before it opened, just because I started pulling a thread and seeing where it went. And actually because of that, I met the people that own the businesses and I made friends with them. And all because I said yes to someone going, you know, would you be interested in yeah, this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's sounds silly, but the weirdest opportunities come out of it. Yeah, yeah, so, totally relate to that. So, obviously, we only see the bits that get edited down on The Apprentice, and I'm sure sort of behind the scenes that a lot of a lot of crazy stuff goes on. Can you remember sort of one of the funniest parts of um, of um, recording the series? Yeah, you love to swear. Yeah, go okay, for it. Cool. Well, I know it wasn't me that swore, but no, <laughs> I remember. I remember me and Ryan Mark were at Thorpe Park, and we were walking past a Nemesis Inferno, and a Nemesis Inferno was obviously in the in between us. And so a lot of people will talk about in between as well as they're on the ride. And as we walked past the front of the ride, we were in suits and people just shouted. One person shouted suit wanker. And the other one shouted briefcase wanker because we had the briefcase as well. And I, I was like, wow, that was, uh, that was pretty good. <laughs> that was brilliant. Good. I guess it's that wasn't on the show. That was, that was on the after show even. <laughs> what? They didn't even know I heard it. it just me and Ryan Mark. I was like, what? He just called you a briefcase wanker. Called me a suit wanker. Yeah, I brilliant. Thought it was brilliant. brilliant, brilliant. 
So what would you say would be your sort of biggest takeaway from the show from a business point of view? Um, do you know what? I think one of the things, I know that there's a lot of things that you, you can learn from those sort of shows. But one of the things that I realized was that it sort of reaffirmed the idea of just jumping into things. Now, yeah. when you do a pitch on that show, it might seem like you've got it prepared or whatever, but actually you generally get taken to a location, you film walking in, and then within a few minutes you go and act in front of people. You don't really get much time to prepare. You might get a couple of minutes, if anything, to prepare a speech whilst talking to complete strangers or professionals in that yeah. field. Um, so that was, that was quite daunting, but it reaffirmed that sort of idea of just jumping in and just giving it a go um, and just getting used to winging it, really. Because you do wonder when you watch the show, yeah, absolutely. That you, you you obviously see as a you know as a as a watcher as a as a you know as a, watching the show, um, you get given that task, and then obviously it cuts to you doing the task. Is there is there quite a timeline between the two? But you're saying no, pretty much you're straight into it, getting on with it. You've got to think on your feet. Which How really boring don't... would it be if they let you prepare for things? Yeah, 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 yeah. Like they they don't want you to do well. It doesn't make good yeah. TV. They want the sound bites, don't they? If you screwing up. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. But again, that sort of that sort of just just going with it and figuring it out and just not not showing fear was something that I took away from it. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, listening to obviously quite a lot of your things um, online, your YouTube, your different videos. Obviously, you, you've got a lot of stuff out there. More and more, it seems. Mm. You know, it seems that um, you know just that attitude of just getting on with it, you know, and getting yourself out there seems to sort of run through you very much. So good for you, mate. Fantastic. Yeah, I think. Similar to, so the same advice that pickup artists give to people who want to pull a girl. They walk into a bar. If you see a girl you like, you're supposed to walk over straight away. And if you get rejected, you get rejected. But you walk over straight away. So you don't have time to talk yourself out of it. Well, that's what they tell them. I do it, but the same thing for me, but for ideas. So if I think of something, before I have time to talk myself out of it, I will figure out how to do it and do it. And if it fails, it fails. But if it doesn't, then I'll carry on. Um, and I have failed massively, don't get me wrong. And there's some, there's some ridiculously things that just blown up my face, but at the same time, yeah, I just, I just sort of don't give myself time to talk out of it. I don't, I don't, I don't think about things too much because if you do, then you're just never going to make it step. Yeah. I guess just keep taking those shots because I think a lot of people are just afraid to take the shots in the first place, aren't they? Um, I was saying about the content the other day, I was saying, I want, I want people to see all this content, all these different channels and all these different things and think that I'm doing it with a team of people. I want people to be like, surely it can't just be him, but actually, it is yeah. me, and I want to just put that much stuff out and take advantage of every opportunity that people will think, how does he do that? Yeah. Um, yeah. That's my personal aim at the moment. So all the content at the moment, you are you are obviously preparing it, filming it, editing it, putting it out there, the design, exactly. everything. Yeah, that's Graphics, it. trailers, soundtracks. Like yeah. I've learned Illustrator, Photoshop, and just learned <laughs> Adobe Auditions. Um, I saw you knew some of your new YouTube stuff, and I thought, oh yeah, and I, and I had a feeling who was helping you. To be honest with it, I'm not about to say names, but uh, I thought, oh fair play, you know, you've got some good guys helping you there. And I went, you, you, yeah. You, no, that's, that's brilliant. Yeah, that's yeah. What I want I want people to be like, surely he's got people doing it for him. No, no, it's all me, <laughs> all from me. I mean, in the future, I can probably afford to pay someone to do it, but right now, I want to do it. I want to learn every single intricate piece of the puzzle because yeah. I think that's what I enjoy a lot of. If you understand every bit of it, then actually, when you do give it to someone else to do, and they give you some bullshit excuse, you'd be like, no, 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 yeah, I've you, done it. Yeah, yeah, they can't pull the wool over your eyes because you've been yeah. there, done it, got a t-shirt. <laughs> I think right now it's exciting and fun, but it's not. It will get mundane, I imagine. Short, short term thing, but uh, yeah, brilliant. So um, obviously, I, see, I keep seeing you popping up on on, on um, the different channels um, on TikTok, doing your different TikToks. Yeah. So who are you more likely to get onto a TikTok? Alan Sugar, Karen Brady, or Nick Hewer? Um. Well, I, you didn't say Claude, but I would I would have said well, Claude. That, that would be the best. Claude, Claude. Uh, I would, God, between Lord Sugar and Karen, I wouldn't even... I'd, I'd just say Nick. The, Lord, Lord Sugar and Karen are just not not fun. Not, no. No, they're just dead. I've never seen a, a fun side to them. Claude would have definitely a thousand percent there. So um, Claude in the interview stage, is he as fierce as he comes out of the, of the TV uh, series? Yeah, no, he's, yeah, he's very scary. But like he in the actual interviews, obviously he's playing a part. So that's his role in the yeah. show. Um, so he's just, he plays that. He doesn't, he doesn't break character. I only saw him break character a couple of times. And once where he told me off separately off camera, because I was losing my shit one day. Um, and when he came over at the end to the guys who were in the show still, and he came out of the boardroom and he was like, just let you know, I'm a real person. And you know we are nice. We just yeah. have to play. Yeah. Yes, I just love that bit where it's the interview stage. You know, they all go in there. Everyone's cacking themselves on it, basically. And he, he builds them up. This is actually quite a good CV. However, this business plan <laughs> is a complete 
<laughs> I, I, I left the interview so obviously the only show bits of I mean the interview itself was like 25-30 minutes per interview yeah. you go on the tee a couple of minutes um, so I mean originally he just went in and shouted at me and then after that he was more but he was more open and like give you some positive feedback so you can take that away one of the things he said to me was like he said what, you know I said I came in here with a digital agency that's what I originally applied with I changed to travel because I thought if you give me 250 grand I'm going to tell you the business I've always wanted to do yeah. Um, I can start an agency without money. So I, I did a business plan just before the show quickly in a couple of weeks and pulled it together. And then I applied. Um, so he said, I, he said, I said, I came in with a digital marketing agency, but if you come in with that business plan, you would have won. He was like, but right now you're the right man with the wrong plan. And that's fair enough. But he did say some nice things about me on the, you know, why I fired them sort of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, it was final five videos. He was like, I, I I think he likes the fact I'm passionate and and I don't know he was a sort of, he he was how I expected him to be I look up to a lot of these people and he was one of the ones that I feel like would genuinely help someone who's trying to learn yeah 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 brilliant so what would you say to somebody that's thinking of going on the apprentice then um, I would I would say do it a thousand percent because again my personal experience is just you take every opportunity that comes your way and your life will be different is it's, there's no two ways about it things will change for you that's another opportunity if you don't take it you'll be left thinking what if someone said on twitter to me he was like oh i got through to the first interviews but then on the way there i went to a bar and i just decided not to go and i was like why would you brag about that why would you brag about not being the sort of person that follows things through because you could have got the show yeah 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 i guess the fear got in the way yeah yeah wow people can say it's not fair they might be like oh well it's a better decision but actually from my perspective it doesn't matter what the opportunity is if it's different different things will happen obviously with this one there's a lot of exposure and a lot of doors do open for you yeah you might be made to look a bit silly and you might be, get people laughing you might get trolls but who cares like for all the benefits and positives that come with it i couldn't give two flying f's <laughs> fair play so um obviously lots of content going out there tell us about that the, the norm vlog series yeah um so that's an idea that came out of, I got speaking to a girl on LinkedIn and we decided to just do a video talking about tattoos. Um, and I've been getting involved in a lot of vlogs and, and podcasts recently. So I was like, yeah, we'll do it. We'll just record it and put it online. And then after she asked me to edit the footage, so I started editing it and I thought, you know what? I used to do these sort of interviews a few years ago when no one had even heard of me because I wanted to meet entrepreneurs and I wanted to learn about them and, and just, you know, get into their circles. So I thought, why am I not doing it now? I've stopped doing it. I put it off for a few years, time to get back to it. Um, and now maybe I'll be able to get more interesting guests because people might have heard of me or because um, people can see what I'm doing now. So the, the, the thought was always, has always been there. A few years ago, there's videos and interviews that I, when I was younger, I'm just bringing it back again and just putting yeah. new skin on it. Um, the fuck the norm is basically the ethos behind who I am as a person. I refuse to follow everyone else's rules. I don't care. And I'm not scared to be myself. And a lot of people are, feel like they're pushed and forced into a certain, um, a certain, box that they have to fill like I don't know when you go into a career you get told to act a certain way dress a certain way speak a certain way and after four or five years you can't tell you from anyone else so I'm sort of getting back to the point where people are asking me well how are you doing all this and who what's your motivation I'm like let me just tell you how it is it's nothing special it's no magic I just take every opportunity that comes my way and I don't think about it I just take action it's that simple and and I just refuse to be um be molded into anyone else's um yeah anyone else's sort of perceptions of who I should be. Yeah, that's basically what it is. It's not me trying to tell anyone who, what to do or how to think. It's if you want to change your life, and if you feel like you want to be someone different, but you don't know how to do it, well, I'm going to show you people who have done it and who have been different, and it has worked out for them. And you can take that from their learnings and you can apply it to your own life. So a lot of good chat with people that have done it. A lot of good chat around um, uh, mental, sort of the mental side of things, because that's usually the block, mm -hmm. isn't it? Most people are, are maybe... Um, um, ingrained in a certain way or been you know, taught a certain way through going to college, uni, to a certain type of career, but they're out and sort of herded into a certain direction in their, in their career. Or, uh, I, I, got to, I got told, I mean, personally, I, I, I'm quite a flamboyant person. I like jump around, I tell jokes every day and whatever. And I, get, I got told, go into a career, you've got to grow up, you've got to act this way, you can't mess around. And I actually rebelled massively. I was like, I'm not going to listen to you. I'm not going to do what you tell me to do. And I went and found better jobs or jobs where they accepted my personality or whatever. And I've continued to do that. I have never stayed in a job. If I ever get told to act a certain way, I will leave and go and find another job. Regardless of whether I have money or not, there's never been a fear there. And that lack of fear has driven me to go from here to here. I was a college dropout five, six years ago. and now a master's graduate with a career in marketing. I'm a director. And I've do you know what I mean? That trajectory doesn't happen because 
I followed the crowd. And I, and I feel like the students and younger people, not necessarily people in a, a, a far into their career, but younger people need to hear that you can just be yourself and you don't have to conform. Yeah. Um, you, you try to instill that in your team so within your agency obviously you've got a you've got an agency um that you're building um so you instill that into your team members as well and give them sort of the, the freedom the creative freedom and the, the ability. I, I, we, we've we've literally just started this agency um so i say we there's two guys that uh are behind it they're the guys finance it and i just get to come and do what i want which is quite easy uh, but they've asked me to sort of create an agency for them yeah. Um, and so they've never had any kind of behaviors or any kind of core values in terms of digital agency before. Um, we've got a team there. I actually, I guess right now, it's just like, I let them have free roam and I'm trying to guide them. Yeah. Um, as we, as we get back to work, obviously we're working together. It will be something that is going to be a core. It's my core value. It's my behavior. Yeah. So if it's me, there's no way in hell is it not going to transfer through to everyone else that I'm working with. Yeah. Or it's just wouldn't work. Values that are going to, go through the business yeah okay so tell us about the travel business um hidden travel yeah so i always wanted to start a travel company i worked in travel for i don't know going on like six years so i dropped out of college i've got i failed college three times i got kicked out three times literally kicked out and then i went like well it's not working so i'm gonna go abroad 18 years old you can travel and work for travel companies so that's what i did i did that non-stop summer winter till i was 21 and i whilst i was abroad I was watching these people and watching how these companies ran and watching how crap they treated their guests or where they cut corners and all these different issues. And I thought, this is just not okay. I also looked at the, the industry, the, sorry, the, the, the cities and the places where they were visiting the types of holidays. And I could see that over time, that type of holiday was starting to die out. So this is going to the tail end of 1830 holidays. Yeah. Um, and they're going out and getting pissed sort of thing. I could see the next generation of millennials who have Instagram were looking for something different. Um, and then you now got Gen Z, which they are looking for something completely different. So actually, it's kind of the perfect mix and the perfect recipe. We, I've worked in the older way of working. I've seen how, it's not, how it shouldn't be done. I've grown up in the Instagram generation and I've been around my peers and understand what they need. And I can see how Gen Z are going to evolve and how other companies aren't taking note of that um, and aren't adapting. So because of that, I thought, I'm just going to start. Like, I've got no money. I don't know how we're going to do it. We don't know what we're doing. We don't know what the first, we didn't know what the first steps were. But we just started working together. I went and found a co-founder, my friend Luke. He used to work abroad and manage other travel companies. And between the two of us, we've just been figuring it out. And we're, we were literally about to launch. But it's sod's law. I decided to start a travel company. And for the first time in living history, all international travel is banned. Um, yeah. Mean, yeah. That ain't a sign. Yeah, it's what it's unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah, I have to admit, we in our agency, we were just about to sign a very large um, villa. Literally, we were like forty-eight hours from signing a villa client <laughs> with a very large villa client. We've already spending about forty grand a month on paid ads, and we were out. like, "Yep." Yeah. Then it was like, "Oh, that's that then." <laughs> All right, so that so that sort of. Um, little bit of bubbling away in the background at the moment and then is that the plan then obviously when things yeah. get, well i think that we're allowed to travel and things ease up and that that'll that'll come back yeah so i think well unfortunately i can't see it i think we'll come out and then we'll go back into lockdown again because i've got a feeling that'll come back in a few months um so we're not rushing too much but what it does give us time is to think about it in more detail and what we want to do um i've got a feeling when travel does open up it's going to be so restricted there's so many different um, issues that it's going to be very expensive for quite a while yeah. um, for even just a normal flights because you got to think about like flights generally run so cheap because they fill them pack them yeah uh, that can't happen anymore airports the way in which they work people are herded and packed yeah. in there for expense everywhere to, yeah, just, to, the, just the logistics of how travel currently operates is going to have to change mm -hmm. uh, and because of that it's going to have to be more expensive and not only that but the guys that are in the resorts and the hoteliers and the bars they're trying to recoup their losses for the last summer maybe yeah. so it's not going to be as cheap as far as as far as i can see it, it's going to be a, a really weird time for travel so we are going to launch as soon as we can and we'll, we'll look at it but we were never designed to be cheap anyway we were always designed to give people value so yeah. you know we were looking for amazing locations and you do pay more for that but with that you get an amazing experience yeah it is good We'll keep an eye on that then as the as the months develop and um, keep an eye on hidden travel. I think, yeah, there was a lot of chatter, I think, um, when we first went into lockdown. Oh, it's going to be cheap holidays, but <laughs> that's the completely opposite, isn't it? Yeah, I was reading about it yesterday. Yeah, even, even if you take away all the logistical issues and all the lost profits and all the things that people need to recoup, you, and, and you still have the fact that the demand is going to far outweigh supply, which naturally will increase price of anything. Yeah. So... Add that on top of everything else, it ain't going to be cheap for a long time, if ever. 
Absolutely. And that's it for the companies that are involved. All, and don't forget, companies might end up closing down as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, like how the hell is Ryanair supposed to survive if they can't pack their flights? No, I mean, it's, it's going to be a lot of people, isn't there? Unfortunately, that won't survive. You know, I think, you know, typically a lot of these firms will have a, a month or six months worth of cash flow, month or, month or six months worth of, of um, sort of money. And obviously we're sort of two, three months into it. A lot of the smaller firms, a lot of the firm, you know, that's quite normal. You know, I think um, a lot of the big firms are reading, you know, that do like, te- you know, hundreds of millions a month. They've got like six weeks worth of cash. So well, I, was, I, was, I was looking into, I heard Jet2 were telling customers that, in July they were gonna so they they'd refunded people before July and they said oh July we're gonna start running our flights again right and I, I was trying to figure out why they would say that because it's very unlikely to be able to run and even if it is they've got to hope that every country they fly to is ready to receive tourism and then those hotels and bars are gonna be open for them to go do you know what I mean so, so I was thinking why would you say that and I realized because if they had to refund all their customers they would go immediately bust it's they need them to move it don't they rebook or you know hold rebook for next year and then that'll be the difference between Nothing. Or not surviving, right? I would think, yeah, yeah. 100%. And then, yeah. yeah, it's just, it's just, it's really sad. But in a way, the silver lining for me and for Luke and and Hidden Travel is, look, we decided we're going to start something new. Right now, the industry is going to be, it's going to have a sort of a cleanse. A lot of businesses that have been maybe clinging on or just saturating the market, or you know, they 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 will, they'll go away. And then it makes room for you know, smaller guys coming through, more forward thinking people to, to yeah. take action. Um, the same thing that happened when, you know, like the, the bubble, the property bubble hit and the recession and everything. Anyone that started during that period, whilst every other business was failing because they had never prepared for it. If you start during that period, you're generally a much stronger business. Yeah. Um, so obviously travel business right now, you know, is sort of, almost on hold or, you know, waiting for signals and signs to where we, where, which direction that might go. So in terms of the e-commerce side of things, you know, the, the, um, the, the clients and things that you do within the agency, what sort of things are you doing with the agency that maybe the listeners, um, what are you seeing with your clients that's working, you know, sort of marketing wise, strategy wise, what sort of tips could you give to people that are listening in that have got e-commerce stores? What sort of things? Well, so I used to work in e-commerce and it's a passion of mine. I, I came through, I became an e-commerce specialist for a while, um, which meant I just went to Argos and told Argos what to do. <laughs> but the point was, um, the one thing I've noticed is that a lot of businesses probably didn't realize just how important their online stores are right now, or well, were even, uh, because they were like, oh, we've got brick and mortar, and you've got all the ignorant businesses, that are quite traditional uh, industries that go, we don't need e-commerce. Right now they do, and they've not got a choice. They have to change, evolve. Um, and I find it interesting. So what, st- what stands out to me is I find it interesting that those that are, I, I use the word ignorant because if you are not a digital business selling your products and services online right now alongside a brick and mortar store, then I'm going to clash you as ignorant because it's important because moving forward, it's not going to go away. The internet's not going anywhere. Um, so right now that's how they survive. Um, I find it very interesting to see who actually still resists. Yeah. I find it, I find it mad. I got, I got talking to a guy. He was a, a liquidator. I was just ringing that. So basically I've been ringing businesses saying, you know what, you're going to try and survive um, through coronavirus. You want to try and get more traffic and sales online now. And I can help you. And I was giving free advice just because I was bored and furloughed. And I was like, why not? Um, and he just went, I'm not listening to anyone who's a marketer. Um, we don't need any help. I went to the website and the website literally says, we do not want a pretty website. We do not like marketers. And it had pictures of pennies on it and they had white backgrounds and it was just blocky. I saw, you, I saw your post, you posted about it yesterday. Yeah, weekend. that's the website. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't yeah. believe how bad the website was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But he was there, so they were liquidators. And I was thinking, surely they're going to be getting quite busy right now. They're going to be back, you would think, yeah. But my, and you, I couldn't even find their phone number and I was looking to ring them. Imagine how difficult it would be if you're actually trying to find out what they do as a service or how they work or where they're based. And I just thought, businesses like that are led like that don't deserve the, the customers. They don't deserve the help. Uh, you know, a, a pandemic and the, I don't want to use all the cliches and all the words, you know, but other than these unprecedented times and, you know, if, if what's happening right now doesn't wake people up, then they've got bigger problems in their business than, than just I, sort of adapting and changing because they're just not willing to change regardless of what is, what is happening. Yeah. I have this ethos in life where I used to try and tell people, like, come on, copy me, like, let's do this together, let's go and do this. And I realised a lot of people just say, no, I don't want to, or, oh, I'm not sure. Or, I actually stopped asking people to do things with me and I started doing things on my own because no one, you know, you can't change someone's mind. If they're set in a certain way, you really can't change their mind. But actually it's a positive because it means that the more people like that there are, the less competition there is for me. So yeah. if I've got a business and I'm, I'm, I'm in an industry and I've noticed that my peers 
aren't making moves right now in them. You know, they're not running PPC ads. They're not running search and social ads. They're not running, um, you know, they're not improving their website. They're not focused on web traffic or SEO. If they just all pause everything and all my peers are doing that, I want to be the guy who goes out and gets that traffic because yeah. it's up for grabs right now. And, and, and everyone that would have previously visited their store in person will go online. Yeah. So why not take advantage of that situation right now? I would be reaching, if, well, for me, I, I kind of know what to do, but if I didn't know anything about marketing, or I didn't know how to do stuff, I'd be reaching out to every agency going, now, because right now is the time to spend. I don't care what anyone says about holding onto your cash. What's the point in holding onto your cash if you just miss out on, yeah. you know, the, the, the 10 times so return you could have had? I right agree. Now. You know, the, the opportunity now, the, the demand for a lot of products, the demand for filling your pipeline, you know, post sort of out of lockdown, you know, the, the, the discounts on um, sort of click clicks, costs on paper clicks seems to be all down. It, you, you know, most, <laughs> most industries' um, competitions are a lot easier on SEO. You know, it's just a bit of a gold rush. You know, that's a bit of a broad statement, but yeah. So obviously, I keep seeing we've touched on TikTok. Where do you see TikTok's place, or what? What you know, e-commerce TikTok. What's the sort of where could that go? I know um, they've allowed certain advertising on there more recently. It's not something I'm that familiar with. Uh, I'm not on there. You won't find me on there as, as yet. My kid, I, I keep looking at it, and my kids, what are you doing? What are you doing? You're not going on there, are you? They're panicking because they think I'm going to go on TikTok. <laughs> um, you do well. Well, yeah, well, you never know. Um, where do you see that going, or where's the opportunity there in this next sort of six, six months or so for e-commerce stores? You, you well, well, I've not, I've not run ads on there yet, but I imagine they'd be expensive just off yeah. uh, just because it's so new. Um, yeah. It reminds me of Snapchat in terms of the advertising platform, yeah. and Snapchat wasn't great. But what what I would say is that I've read into what TikTok's plans are, and they have already started trialing um, your sort of e-commerce connected so you know like linkedin uh, sorry instagram you click the post and it shows you all the products in it yeah. they've already tried they're already trying that sort of way of working in china where you would see a video you click whatever and you go through to buy whatever oh, right. yeah yeah so that's shop now functions in there yeah. and they're so that will roll out and then you've got ads i think the ads are see the problem with the ads on tiktok are these kids like to take the piss out of everything they're a meme generation they will as in meme, as in not, they're a meme generation as well, but meme, M-E-M-E. -E. So they have grown up taking the piss out of everything always. So whenever you see an advertiser on, on TikTok, the comments are all taking the mick. If you ever come across as pushy or salesy on there, they will all hound you and take the mick out of you because you're not, you're not part of their culture. You're just trying to push your own agenda. They don't work like that. Yeah, which um, is anti, yeah. Yeah, well, they're, they're, they are anarchists by nature. Their app is, anarchist, is anarchistic. I don't know, whatever. They, they are by nature against everything, but for fun. They, so you need to be a part of that culture. So using it for brand building is fantastic. Uh, being more transparent is great. If you've got a younger target audience, fantastic. Just make videos and they will naturally come across to your channel and they will naturally look into your products because they are inquisitive. Um, joining with trends, have some fun. You're going to look a twat. There's no way around it. So. <laughs> My only advice to everyone right now would just play with it, figure it out, and look yeah. stupid because what might look stupid to you anywhere else on the internet on TikTok is normal. Um, but I can see the e-commerce linking coming. I think the ads are fantastic. But right now, you don't need any of that sort of stuff. Um, I would say the, the ad platform will be very similar to Facebook and Instagram as well, I think, sorry. Um, I think it'll very much be that sort of pay for reach. And impression. Maybe, maybe start having a play with it in terms of on the organic side, figuring it out for right when now. maybe the ads platform matures a bit more. Obviously, it's very, very new, you know. Would that, would that be fair? Uh, yeah, I think I, I like to look at this now, like the, when Instagram first rolled out, when or when Facebook first came out, and everyone would naturally like everything. I remember that my Facebook used to say, I like Inbetweeners, the film The Mask, Dumb and Dumber, like I used to like all my favorite films and like all yeah, this sort yeah. of stuff. And you'd write on someone's wall when you wanted them. Like, so right now it's that sort of or completely organic, honest engagement. No yeah. one can make any money as an influencer. So people are just following people naturally. So yeah. right now is the time to build a real audience. When it starts making money, when it starts being an advertiser platform and there's money on, there's money at play, people will start being stingy with the follows, stingy yeah. with the likes because they will think, oh, if I like their post, they might make some money. Yeah. So. Right now is the, the perfect time to start playing with it. And that's the best piece of advice I can give you. But it's going to be... Yeah, very right. similar to, like I say, very similar to a lot of channels. You know, they start off as, you know, a bit of a fad, you know, or whatever you, what you want to call it. And then as time and obviously their audience, their numbers, their millions progress. Obviously, they then start developing an app platform that goes with it. And then all of a sudden, it's like, well, and those that are early adopters quite often 
you know, get the cheaper traffic, get the cheaper eyeballs. So yeah, I think it's one one to look out for for the e-commerce stores listening in the early days. Um, well, I think uh, anyone that's listening, um, keep an eye on Lewis's TikTok because obviously that will evolve as it is doing. Uh, you know, as a, as a sort of leader on TikTok on e-commerce, so that'll be good to to keep an eye eye on. So. In terms of um, the different marketing channels for e-commerce stores, is there any sort of specific channels that you would um, sort of recommend? Um, obviously, obviously, I know there's a lot of sort of caveats to any any answer to yeah. that, but is there any sort of specifics there you would recommend to e-commerce stores? Well, it depends. I mean, it depends obviously on who. Like all of all marketing is very simple. It's who you're trying to target, how do they speak, and where can you find them. That's pretty yeah. much it. Yeah, and you just produce content to match that. Um, but for me. I always, so it no matter what the e-commerce story is or what the channel is, that depends on, the channel will depend on who you're trying to target. But right now, for me, with any e-commerce business, the first thing I do is I look at in-house. As in, by in-house, I mean, what does your website look like? Can I find areas of friction on your website? Is it open and honest? Is there ways in which a customer could get confused and have to go somewhere else? And actually, nine times out of ten, whenever I go through a website, I can find a ah, shared load of issues, yeah. loads of problems, and loads of friction areas, which might not sound like a lot. But actually, if I'm trying to buy this microphone, which I bought yesterday on Amazon, and I can't figure out whether it has a sound card in it or not because you've missed that one detail out, I'm going to go find it somewhere else. It sounds so silly. Yeah. The wire length, you know, whether it will get wet and damaged, where it needs to be placed. Like, I know it needs to go there because the actual instructions on the thing had a picture of it. These are so simple. Product videos showing it. Like, so information, product information. Then also looking at the, I also then look at websites and match it to SEO. So, you know, Google search, the way in which search works, you know, they search by keyword or they search by product number or they search by color. Does my website have those labels on there that match that? Do, yeah. do I just have microphone or do I have black microphone, windproof, um, and the product number to make sure people can find it? Because people search on Google how they do the website. So I start in-house, what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, discover those friction points. And only then will I start spending money out there uh, in any other channel. So a real strong user-friendly experience all the way through that flow. Yeah. I think you're right. I think a lot, definitely, you know, a lot of sites, they sort of, you know, they think they've, you know, they maybe spent a bit of money on design, you know, got a nice theme and spent a bit of money on a designer or vice versa, or, you know, had something built from scratch, whatever it may be, they've imported their products. But then they, you know, you get to that product page, it's just dead simple and they haven't thought it through. They haven't got all that extra info that like you, you know, talked about reviews, product reviews, video reviews, video demonstrations. You have to admit, I've, I've been looking at, we're obviously all, all sat at home doing our thing, aren't we? We've been creating content and, and various side projects and this, that and the other. And I bought myself a, a um, oh, it's in my, yeah, it's in here actually. I bought myself one of these, um, gimbal type thing oh yeah they're good they're wicked them yeah and they're, they are absolutely amazing it was like 80 quid it's like unbelievable for what it is is it on for a camera or for a phone yeah it does the whole you know you, you unlock it and then it follows you around you know you lock it on your face and then wherever you go you know, it follows you around but exactly what you just said you know i went to various websites and had a look and the ones that something like that it's quite a lot of questions you've got you know does it does it follow you does it you know how long's the battery ask for mm -hmm. da, 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 da. so i'm like right video straight to videos watching the videos watching the videos watching the videos and the sites that had the videos had the reviews you know i bought the site that had the best you know bought from the site that had the best um you know experience around the product rather than just the manufacturer details basic copy paste or even just straight from a csv and import yeah. so there's the next thing is so this is what so again i see i used to go to argos and tell them off because this basically what i did so argos as a retailer uh would get their production so their copy their imagery their videos all comes from the the dish, the, the people that make the products the manufacturers yeah. Yeah. manufacturers use the same copy same images everywhere on the internet so whoever puts it on their website first gets the benefits of the seo yeah because obviously then everywhere else it goes is duplicate content. Something so simple, but it's aligning your rest, basically aligning best practice SEO with your website, aligning best practice user experience with your website. What is the point in spending money on advertising? If you get to your website, it's crap. Or you, you, all you do is you raise awareness of the product. People go, I want to buy that. They come to your website. They can't find the right information. So they go to your competitor and buy it yeah. because they have the correct information. So unique copy, unique content. I, I hate this word, a star, a star copy or Amazon first copy, or whatever the hell they used to say. It's ridiculous. It just all it just means stuff it with keywords. It's not about that. It's just real features and benefits. There's another thing as well. People add features, but they never add benefits. Yeah. They'll go, oh, it's a shiny black microphone that is windproof. So, because I don't know anything about microphones, it's windproof because when the wind blows, it sounds like someone's farting down the tube. I don't know. Like, it sounds so simple, but actually, I encourage anyone, 
I'm not talking about marketing channels. Marketing channels wise, it depends on who you're trying to reach. But if you want to do something right now, take some time, go through your products, right? And also, it's very interesting. Pareto's law will probably apply. So you'll probably find that 80% of your sales come from 20% of your products. So the first thing that I would do right now is sit with a list of those 20% of those products. I would go through them with a fine tooth comb and make sure that it has unique copy. It has eight images. It has a video. Does the product title have all the right? attributes that people might search from a website is it easy to find and, and make sure that if I came to that website with any, any idea of what I wanted to do, I would buy it because I, all the information is there. Yeah. I'd start with those first 20%. That's fantastic. That is absolutely gold there guys. Anyone listening in now, you know, 80, 20, we talk about it all the time in our agency. Oh. Absolutely bang on. We actually have a book. <laughs> oh, God damn it. I led him into a I prepared this. Let I led him into a sale. <laughs> Who could have, who could make it it's, up? It's so true. So true. Where to start, you know, drilling in, drilling in, right. Rewriting those, that 20% or the 20% of the 20%, you know, the rewrite of those product descriptions, focus on those products. Fantastic. Fantastic. I think, you know, just so many sites we see, I think, um, that just, they spend all that money on look and feel potentially, but then they miss you know, those products, ultimately, when somebody goes to a site, they're going to a product, you know, an e-com store is based on product. You've got that brand at the front end, and yeah, that's very important. But you've got those products that ultimately they've typed in that product name, that product code, that product manufacturer part number. They've landed on that page. But if that page, obviously, if you've got just a generic description that's come from a manufacturer, they're not going to find you on SEO to start with because you'd be on page three or whatever. Mm. But then, you know, if you haven't got a well-crafted page with all that extra stuff on, you know, you're just not going to convince, inspire them to, to, to click the button. So, yeah. One thing, one thing I noticed a lot of was that a lot of companies have obviously evolved. So and they, might, they might have added their first product five years ago and they've changed the website since. They ne but their, their first products that they added might be where most of their sales come from still. So they've never gone back. They never revisit the products they had. They just throw new products on there and move on to the next one. Yeah. The next season, the next you know, summer, spring or autumn, winter, whatever. But actually, it could be something that was on there previously that gets them those sales. And if they just change the copy and adapt to the new way of working or make sure it's mobile friendly or whatever, they'll increase the sales by 20, 30%. But 30% yeah. of a million pound of sales is a lot of money. Yeah. Um, this is what I did for Argos. And we saw, ah, when I say a huge... I mean, a ah, huge uplift in sales. So much so that they were asking me to sit with their digital team and explain to them what I've done for Remington and George Foreman so they could apply it to every other customer and every other client. And it was a case of just best practice. Is it aligned with SEO? Treat it like a website. Every product listing, treat it like a website. But on top of that, is there any friction areas? You know, do I have features without benefits? It sounds so simple. It's all basic. But it's those basics that really make the difference in a sale or not. Brilliant, Lewis. Thank you. Right. So last couple of questions. So what advice would you give to brands and e-commerce stores that are looking to build their Instagram follower account? I know you're mm -hmm. very big on social and, and Insta. Yeah, so what yeah. sort of advice can you give the guys listening in? Sorry, my dog's eating something. One sec. <laughs> eating my shirt. Um, so for me, I think I, I've been finding it quite difficult. So I didn't, I've never really tried to build my personal Instagram. I've done it for companies and, and websites. One thing we've tried all sorts, we've done the thing where you run ads in different countries like Slovenia for random countries and see if they get followers. It works. You do get followers, but they don't buy anything. So there's no benefit. Yeah. Um, so the first thing I would say to any brand that wants to in, in, increase their following and be like, why? What's your reason? If it's an ego boost or if it's just, I want to look better than my competition, don't even bother wasting your money or time because it's not going to lead you anywhere. It doesn't matter whether you have 10,000, 20,000, 100,000. When you get there, like I thought having a blue tick would change my life. It didn't. Nothing happened. It's irrelevant. <laughs> it might make you feel better for a day. So it was a good day. Point. It was a good like, fist pump for a day, was it? <laughs> yeah, I was hung over and I was like, oh yeah, it's there. And that was it. <laughs> well, that, that's my point. So once you get it, it's irrelevant. So actually, in terms of an actual real target, make it something that's going to generate business. So why are you trying to do that? Um, I would say that the best way to do it would be what we've been doing with Hidden is we've been working with, um, we've been working with great content creators and we, we share their content. We don't try and create everything ourselves because we, you know, we're not specialists. We're not in resorts like that right now. We, yeah. So we, we use the people's content and we tag them in it as well. And we share those links and they share our links. So very collaborative way of working for our Instagram. Yeah. Um, I like to uh, engage people. So I like to, you know, again, be open and honest on my personal Instagram, which is just like, if something funny happens, I share it. If someone sends me a message saying I'm going to hell and that God's, there's one on my Instagram right now, which is like, God says that the word fuck in the norm is means that you're going to hell. I shared it because I thought it was hilarious. So being honest and open about who you are and what you, what you do day to day, again, similar to how TikTok works. Yeah. Repurposing content is quite good as well. I found that TikTok videos on Instagram do really well because people on Instagram haven't seen it on TikTok. They don't understand that's a trend. That's great, yeah. 
I think that's 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 I saw your TikTok videos on LinkedIn, I think, as well, yeah. Yeah, yeah that was me just doing tests. And then I, was, I watched it, because I was like, oh, exactly what, you, exactly what you just said. I thought, oh, TikTok on, on LinkedIn, no one's doing that, and I'm not on TikTok, and I'm not that familiar with it personally, so it made me want to look at it. And now my sort of TikTok, I'm sort of on the, I'm probably on, I'm on the ladder of number two on the ladder of probably 50 steps, but I'm on the ladder sort of thing. TikTok's in, in my back two of my weeks, In two weeks, you'll be in a wig singing Haggy <laughs> Pink songs. That's why I was on a bike with a wig on. <laughs> yeah. So oh, the, 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 I, I started trying to find new things for my, this, I'm talking about personal Instagram again now. I'm trying to find new things like TikTok videos, like those trending videos that are funny there that everyone does. And yeah, yeah they might get views there, but if you share that on LinkedIn and Twitter and Instagram, they generally generate a great engagement. Um, I've started hashtagging again on Instagram. Yeah. Um, a lot of people have stopped. So if everyone stopped doing it, I'm going to start doing it because again, that's natural engagement. But also here, here's some interesting I'll share with you, which is my personal observation. TikTok's way of working is via hashtags. Everyone has to hashtag, otherwise it doesn't get seen by anyone. So people are getting back to the younger, the younger kids are getting back and used to hashtagging things again, whereas everyone stopped. So right. if you're trying to do right. that, it, yeah, and you search via hashtag. So if everyone's searching that on TikTok, well, they're going to start doing it again on Instagram. So yeah. look at your followers, look at what hashtags they follow, collect them, yeah. you know, have a copy and paste note ready, use a hashtag generator, whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, look at the content, make it interesting and collaborate. They're my top tips for Instagram. Brilliant. Okay. So last couple, final, final couple. So we always like to um, end on a book recommendation um, to sort of the guys that are listening in any uh, what would be your sort of number one book recommendation at the moment uh, i was I, literally the first that popped in my head was the one that's on the side next to the bed that i haven't opened and i've had it for about a year which is really annoying me because i listen to audiobooks when i drive from oh yeah audio more yeah um i would start with do you know what i really like i don't know i know everyone's read it uh it annoys me that everyone's read it. Rich, rich dad poor dad is yeah. one of the best because i've got it on audiobook and i listen to it a lot and i've repeated it over and over again yeah. every time i listen to it i get something different from it yeah, Robert every Kier. single time. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's that's. I mean, that, everyone's heard that one now. Everyone's seen it. I would go with a really weird one as well, like the richest man in Babylon. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what it is? I've not actually read that. I, I know everyone that I know recommends it, or a lot of friends recommend it, but I've not actually read it. I've not actually read it. I'm recommending that because I got recommended to me when I reached out at 21 years old. I sent a big long email to this very successful entrepreneur, multimillionaire, yeah. and he came back with a voice note and it made me cry. But one of the books he recommended was The Richest Man in Babylon. He said, there's a secret in there, read it. And when you get through the book, read it again, and you'll, you'll start to realize what the secret is. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I've got it yet, still. I've, I've read it about, God knows, like a hit times. Yeah. But it's one of those ones that it's like an old fable style uh, book. It tells a story of, you know, it's quite, it's quite biblical to be fair, but not actually religious. It's like biblical times. But the point is, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff in there. So The Richest Man in Babylon. Right get that on the list then so the guys that are listening that want to find out more about you lewis where's the best place for them to go which websites or social media yeah. or uh well you can you can type f star fuck with a star the norm on youtube or or on spotify at the moment or you can find me on twitter i'm lewis ellis or yeah. instagram lewis underscore ellis or just type lewis ellis in it's going to come up because i'm good at marketing yeah <laughs> I guarantee you'll find me if you just type Lewis. Don't find Lewis. That's your problem, not Lewis's problem, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, I think, I think I've just spent so much time obsessing over whether my links show on, on Google yeah. and that, that you can find me now. Oh, fantastic. Well, Lewis, thank you so much for being on the show. And I look forward to